are here today at Indian River State College for the 10th annual Project Citizen District Showcase. Seventh grade students in St. Lucie County have been researching civics and have been looking at public policy issues within their community. Today we have our finalists from our schools um, and they are showing the local problems that they've been researching, the public policy alternatives, a solution that they've come up with to solve their problem and their action plan. We have uh, judges from across the community here in order to see all their projects and to give them feedback in case some of them go on to our next round of the state finals. My name is Jelena and I'm with Alapata Flats. My name is Maria Zawala. And I'm with APF. My name is Josiah Nogan. I'm from Alapata Flats. So one problem in this community today is school shootings. And these kids are not safe in school. So we, we were researching. And from my experience, we did a little bit from my experience, because I was a couple miles away from the school. Um, I was a couple miles away from Parkland. Stoneman Douglas and we had to go on Code Yellow and it was like a scary experience. I remember I didn't know any like anything that was happening or going on and we all we all shut the lights off and like we were quiet because they were still looking for the shooter so that's like what I remember from my experience and that's kind of a little bit, like my group decided on why to research this topic because of that and I knew a couple people that knew people that went to Stoneman Douglas and they had friends that died there that day. So it, it was close to the heart. Um, alternatives to stop the school shootings is for students and staff to wear ID badges to see whether or not they belong in the building and clear backpacks for to see if they have a weapon in their bag. And the last thing is metal detectors um, that can prevent people from entering the building with a harming weapon. An action plan is a survey for all middle schools to see how they feel about, to feel about their safety in school. The second one is to interview uh, the resort, no wait, the resource, the resource officer. And the third one is to have a survey, right? Yeah, on the school. Yeah, safety information for all the schools to see how they feel. Hello, I'm Maiden from Westgate K-8. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Aracelis. Hi, I'm Lucas. Did you know that PFAL, also known as peacocks, live throughout Port St. Lucie and Fort Pierce? Well, if you don't, you're not alone. Our problem is trying to solve the negative impacts in the communities caused by peacocks. Peafowl come into neighborhoods because citizens wanted them as pets and then released them but didn't know how to take care of them. This is a problem because peacocks are extremely loud throughout the day, dig, dig holes in yards, leaving feces that can cause disease, peck at cars, and block roads. However, some residents find them beautiful and helpful with eating bugs and with scaring pests with their squawking. Our local government, specifically the Department of Animal Control, should be involved because as they see in their website, their job is to protect the health and safety of the public and from loose, vicious, sick, and injured animals, as well as to educate the public. There were three alternative options for the project before we chose our final policy. Policy one was education of the public. The advantages of the education of the public were that it was low cost, would protect peacocks and citizen, and would help keep the peafowl population at a manageable level. The disadvantages were it did not solve the overall problem completely, and citizens may not use all the materials provided. The second option was use of outdoor vendors. Advantages were vendors are already equipped and experienced for, catch for catching and relocating peafowl. The disadvantages were that it may be costly, wouldn't get rid of peafowl, for the peafowl could return and repopulate, and they may not capture the peafowl humanely. The last and final policy was peafowl crossing signs. The advantages were that it was low cost. The disadvantages were it does not solve the overall problem, and most citizens do not want the signs in their neighborhoods, for it could attract tourists. 
As a class, we feel that the best policy to solve the negative effects on PFAL residential neighborhoods is to work with the De Port St. Lucie Department of Animal Control. We believe public education on peacocks will help citizens learn how to be safe with regards to the PFAL and the protection of their property. We propose a policy of providing the public through the local government with general information on PFAL with a focus on using deterrent measures to prevent and lessen the negative behaviors caused by PFAL in residential neighborhoods. The branch or agency we feel is responsible for assisting us in our policy is the Port St. Lucie Department of Animal Control. As stated on their website, the mission of the Animal Control Division is to protect the health and safety of the public from loose, vicious, and sick, injured animals. We strive to educate the public about responsible pet ownership and provide programs to decrease the number of unwanted pets in the community. We are aware that our research shows that the negative PFAL comments are low, but also that the populations of PFALs grows rapidly. So we believe our policy will help prevent the spread and increase of PFALs in Port St. Lucie neighborhoods. Through research on articles about invasive species, complaints made about peacocks in cities all over Florida, and the U.S. survey and interview questions, we have found that this can become a serious problem for residents. As stated before, advantages to our policy are it is low cost, protects the people and the citizens, and it will help keep the people populations at a manageable level. Some disadvantages are it does not solve the problem completely, and not all the citizens will use the materials provided. We believe our policy policy does not violate any rights granted in the U.S. Constitution. All we plan to do is provide information to the PSL Department of Animal Control. Some of the things we have done to coming up with our final policy was to give out a questionnaire to the class to research problems in our community. We then gathered people's point of view by giving out surveys and held interviews with members of the community. After contacting the local government, we we were directed to the Department of Animal Control, where we, where we have been corresponding through email with the director, Brian Lloyd, to see if our policy of working with the department to provide information on their website, which it currently has none of, could be implemented. We then began to create a brochure that gives general information on how to take care of peacocks on your property, as well as how to protect property from peafowl, and we have shared this information with the Port St. Lucie Department of Animal Control, and we are wait awaiting the response. We decided to create a Facebook and Instagram account to give easier access to our information. The posts are designed to inform people what PFAO is like, dislike, why and how their behaviors can be harmful to them. We feel that these websites can be placed for people to share comments and feedback on what does and does not work when dealing with PFAO. Moving forward, we would like to build data and research by ga ma gathering more information on private pest control vendors and the Port St. Lucie Department of Animal Control as well as see if college, colleges or universities have done any research on flock behavior, patterns, etc. We would also like to make a map of areas affected by PFAO so we can focus on these, the, these areas first. We have done this all because the problem with peacocks is spreading out and it's costing people a large amount of money in repairs. And there are policies, but we have used those as stepping stones for our own policies and has guided us for a more efficient way to deal with PFAO. Thank you for listening to our presentation. I'm Moise Clark. I'm Nicholas Remy. I'm Darndi Saliska. I'm Alicia Taylor, and we're from Democratic Middle School. <laughs> the problem. Many students feel that they are picked on either in school or out of school. With the use of technology, it has become easier for, stu for students to pick on one another. Cyberbullying, according to StopBullying.gov, says cyberbullying is bullying that takes place over digital devices like cell phones, computers, and tablets. Cyberbullying occurs through SMS, text, and apps on or online and social media, formal or gaming, where people can view, participate in, or share content. Separate bullying includes sending, posting, or sharing negative, harmful, false, or mean content about someone else, causing embarrassment or humiliation. Many students also have believed that they are, have been a victim of cyberbullying, seen others cyberbully someone, or have they themselves been part of, cyber, of cyberbullying. Conduct research plus gather data. According to the Megan Murr Foundation.org, nearly one in five students, 21%, report being bullied during the school year, impacting over five million youth annually. Almost all forms of bullying peak in middle school, specifically sixth grade students report the highest percentage of bullying, 29%. Approximately 34% of students report experiencing bullying during their lifetime. Many separate bullying crimes are not reported, which makes it hard to be able to tell the true amount of students that are affected by cyberbullying.
Cyberbullying and it affects our both local and state level. Local because if a student is cyberbullied and there is evidence to show local law enforcement can become involved. This is also a state issue that because there is a state statute that makes it against the law to cyberbullying someone. In the state of Florida, cyberbullying falls under the category of stalking. This shows how the state and local government must work with one another to prevent cyberbullying, along with the effects being suicide. To be able to prevent cyberbullying measures must be taken at the local level to ensure that students can attend schools safely and not be a victim of cyberbullying. Secondly, students must work with local authorities to be able to provide information when someone is being cyberbullied. Lastly, having a state government creates laws making it illegal to cyberbully allows for there to be consequences when someone is cyberbullying. There are three different alternatives that we had came up with. The first alternative is to have students take a life skill class as an elective class. This would allow for students to learn life skills to help them be able to deal with conflict and learn how to problem solve. Alternative two is to have high school students come to mentor middle school students. This would not only give middle school students an opportunity to open up and talk to someone within their age range, but it will also allow for high school students to be able to get community service hours to help either with graduation or college scholarships. Lastly, the last option. Option three is having therapists in school to be able to meet with students and possibly give group sessions to have students be able to work through conflict, as well as talk to someone about issues that they may be going through, such as bullying. Evaluate the pros and cons. Alternative one, life skill classes. Pros, students can, schools can prepare students for success by giving them life skills. It can help students understand how to better deal with one another and resolve conflict. Cons. It can it costs money to have a new class added to school. Conflict might be resolved from the class. Alternative number two: have high school students mentor middle school students. Pros: students who receive positive support in middle school increase graduation rates. Other areas have positive success rates when they are prepared with a positive mentor. Cons: giving plenty of high school students to volunteer to mentor some students may not feel comfortable. Alternative number three, have therapy in school and have more therapists in schools to help students. Pros, students can walk through problems with a therapist. If a, student is being, if a student is being bullied, therapy can help stop it. Cons, some students might be scared, students might be embarrassed. Our action plan is to have high school students come to middle school and mentor middle school students. This will allow middle school students to be able to talk to someone about their problems and feel that they can talk with someone through their problems. This is the best plan because it has the most benefit for the least amount of cost. High school students will also benefit and be able to get community service hours for high school graduation or even college scholarships. Evaluate the action plan. Each school year, the plan will be evaluated to determine if it was successful. Student surveys will be handed out to students twice, one at the end of the first semester and one at the end of the second semester. This will determine to see if students feel better and more confident after having mentors talk to them. We will also have the mentors fill out a survey to ask them how they feel about being a mentor to a younger student. These surveys will be evaluated to determine the positive outcomes of the mentoring program as well as what areas of the program can be improved. We'll also talk to the dean's office to see if there is a lower number of reports of cyberbullying both in and out of school. These students are outstanding in their thinking. They did very good in articulating what the problem was, uh, who's involved, who they could talk to, some of the research, um, and how to put an action plan in place. This is my first time judging. It was an absolute um, wonderful experience, and it was great to see our hard work, um, our hardworking students actually take what they're learning in the classroom and put it into an actual plan uh, to change where they live, to make ch policy changes in the community.
some of them stayed on what's happening and what community ideas they could bring forth. And some students really went deeper and understood the legislation involved and who they can talk to in the government, such as their mayor. Um, some of them actually called the mayor and spoke to the mayor. Um, they talked about litter problems opiate addictions, um, making everyone feel unique and special and how they can change that. Uh, they were very you know, upset with regards to bullying because people were different. Uh, litter prevention, I like that. Uh, several groups talked about that and how they could uh, solve that problem in our community. My name is Eddie Maddox and we are from Samuel Gaines Academy. My name is Daniel Parker. My name is Evan McGarry. My name is Christopher Avila. Our problem is the power, the power of pollution and how it is affecting our community from three different perspectives. The first perspective is in my community and it is secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke is a dangerous type of pollution due to the amount of deaths and health problems humans get from it. I quote, severe asthma attacks, respiratory and ear infections, and SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. And I quote, there is 41,000 deaths among adults in the U.S. due to secondhand smoke. In my community, it is disturbing that people are smoking even though they have children. The second perspective is in Evans community and he is dealing with air pollution. The Tropicana factory near his house releases more than 3.5 pounds of carbon dioxide of half orange juice. The third perspective is in Christopher's community and he is dealing with noise pollution. People in this community are causing too much noise when driving and when they are driving they are causing lack of sleep. When the people in his community are trying to sleep, they can't because they are making too much noise. Our alternative policy to the problem is for noise pollution, secondhand smoke, and air pollution. Our policy for noise pollution is to enforce the laws and say cars should be checked for loud and obnoxious noises. An advantage for this is that silent cars will go down the road. A disadvantage is that it takes a while and there will be loud cars going down the road while other cars are being checked. An alternative policy for secondhand smoke is that the government should take action and make a limit on smoking in certain areas. An advantage is that certain areas will be banned from smoking. A disadvantage is that people will try to find another public area to smoke. Our last policy is to petition the state to put a limit on how much smoke factories can produce. An advantage is that there will be less smoke in the air and people can breathe easier. A disadvantage is that workers will refuse to do this and just continue putting smoke in the air. We propose to either ban smoking in certain areas, or if that is not possible, we could create certain spaces where people could smoke freely without worrying about secondhand smoke. One of the other types of pollution is the emission from cars and the fumes from factories. Uh, we propose that the state puts a limit on how much fumes factories produce and lowering the speed limits so that gas is burnt slower. The last of our policies deals with noise pollution. We propose that laws should be enforced, that cars should be checked for loud parts before entering streets. The advantages of the first two policies are that they reduce overall pollution and make life better to live. But the disadvantages, on the other hand, is that big companies will be less productive and smokers will have less of an area to smoke. But on the third, but, but the third policy deals with a completely different type of pollution, so it has different advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that noise won't keep people up all night. And the disadvantage is that it takes a long time to check the cars for loud parts. And out of all of our policies, none of them violate your, right, your individual rights or freedom of speech. The main pursuit of our plan is to limit the amount of pollution released each day. Our first step is to send out petitions through the mail. Then after we gather enough information, our plan is to build a website to spread awareness about pollution and tell people how we can stop this. 
Then our next step is to collect signatures through our website and try to get noticed by bigger groups and individuals. Furthermore, our activities will be funded by charities and grants from the government. The different agencies and groups willing to support our plan will be the EPA, Greenpeace, and Natural Resource Defense Council. Then, to win their support, we will try to build up our website off the media to get noticed by these groups. Influential groups and agencies who will oppose this plan will be multiple tobacco shops, big factories, and construction companies. The advantages of this plan are will limit health problems, most commonly lung cancer, and will encourage other people to follow along and will reduce pollution, which will help our environment. To conclude, we believe that pollution is a big and persistent problem in our community, and of course we recognize this will be a very challenging issue to solve with many obstacles standing in our way. However, we are confident that our policy can have an effect in our community's area. Good morning, my name is Alexia Morgan and we are from Palm Point Educational Research School. Good morning, my name is Caleb Chukayanki and I'm from Palm Point Educational Research School. Good morning, I'm Hannah Dorval, I'm from Palm Point Educational Research School. Good morning, my name is Devin Habian and I'm from Palm Point Educational Research School. Our class decided to research the child drowning rates in Florida. Our state leads the nation in drowning deaths of what children one to four years of age. According to the Florida Department of Health, annually in Florida, enough children to f drown to fill three to four preschool classrooms before their fifth birthday. This problem affects our community locally as well as statewide. 80% of child drownings involve children under five. This statewide problem is in some way being addressed. The Institute for Child Health Policy states the Florida Office of Injury Prevention began an outreach campaign in 2006, using its injury surveillance data to target the most affected counties. This problem should be handled by the government because it affects the safety and well-being of our state's children. Broward and Palm Beach County have coalitions and task forces in place to assist this problem. St. Lucie County does not currently have any specific solutions. The policies in other counties may not be able to solve this problem statewide. From our survey, the majority of students believe this is a problem and more should be done about it. Specifically, providing swim lessons to small children and educating parents about water safety. Individuals, groups, and organizations with an interest in this problem are widespread. The levels of government agencies responsible for dealing with this problem go from locally to all the way to the national level. We have chosen to focus our efforts in our county. We spoke to our congressman and we reached out to our mayor. We feel like we can make a difference. The first alternative policy that our class came up with is to have swimming lessons provided for kids under the age of five. A small fee will have to be paid by the parents of the children if they are over five. Another policy that our class came up with to have lifeguards at all pools and beaches at all times. And the final policy that our class came up with was to have pool contractors give families and HOAs, homeowners association, a contract concerning the supervision and swim instruction for children. Pool contractors would also be required to install pool alarms in all new pools. We think the best way to solve this problem is to work with local legislators to enact a policy that states that the city will provide swimming lessons to children under five at no cost and to teens and adolescents under 15 on a sliding fee scale depending on the family's economic status and their swimming capabilities. This basic curriculum will allow kids to know how to swim for a lifetime, decreasing their risk of drowning for years to come. As a part of our action plan, we've arranged to contact many people who can help execute this policy, including Port St. Lucie's Mayor, Mr. Oravec, and other local legislators and influential individuals. We plan to promote awareness and win public support by using petition, petitions, posters, surveys, and social media. We've already started putting this plan into action by interviewing Brian Mast, state congressman, about this issue. Not only did he encourage us to keep working on this project, he even offered to speak to our mayor and introduce our policy solution. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Layla Paradise. Hi, I'm Anaya Baker. Hi, I'm Julian Brizuela. Hi, I'm Marquise Bell, and we are all from Del Middle School. 
Florida's funding for education just doesn't add up. I'm sure you already probably know that is your tax dollar that pays for our education. But did you know a recent national study gave Florida an F for effort? Florida ranked 42nd out of 50 for education funding per student. Come on, Florida. Florida's average funding per student was found a staggering $3,000 less than the national average. As students in this beautiful and at sometimes amazing state, we felt cheated. An additional $3,000 per student seems like it would help us provide with the materials and technologies we need to help our education. Also, Florida's high school graduation rate is the 14th lowest in the nation, and 28% of those graduates went on to complete a bachelor's degree. We are also ranked the third lowest state for adults who make an income at or above the national average. We've been told our whole lives that if we study hard and do well in school, we will, make a, we will have a good job and make a lot of money. But these odds have us concerned. Once we decided on our problem, we started brainstorming possible solutions. One of our classmates mentioned solar energy, and pretty much the whole class quickly agreed on our schools should switch to solar too. I mean, we do live in a sunshine state, after all. We started doing research to see if any of the schools had made a change before and if they were successful in saving money or not. We found out that there is now over 5,000 schools across the country with solar panels. These schools are saving money on electric bills, education, children, and cleaning energy and create a brighter future for our students. Can the McCarty Middle School be the next to switch? We looked at a smaller district in Minnesota that had made the switch over the next 25, 25 years. The school district and the project had been saved $7.7 .7 million in the energy costs. The district used a community energy garden that is also members of the community to switch to solar. What a bright idea. To gather more perspectives, we sent out 130 surveys in the beginning of our project. And by the end, we had received 71 surveys back. That's over 50% of surveys returned. 100% well, of students answered that they think our schools need more money to provide a more quality education. And an amazing 70% of students answered that solar energy was the best solution. We were glad to see them as excited about the possibility of switching as we were. We also surveyed some teachers. Both switching to solar and fundraising fund ra was selected by 42% of teachers and only 16% chose raising taxes. Lastly, we surveyed some citizens. 100% of surveys 100% of citizens answered yes, they think our schools need more money to provide a more quality education. And 75% of them chose switching to solar as the best solution. Finally, it was time to use everything we learned to make an action plan. It is a long-term plan that will provide lasting benefits to the students of Florida. Step one, invite someone from the Fort Pierce Utilities Authority to talk to our class about solar energy and energy savings in general. Step two, invite school board members to our class and for discussion and debate. Step three, after meeting up with the FPUA and other school board members, we will know how much money will be needed for installation of solar panels at Dan McCarty, and we will learn how much an average a school can do by fundraising. Step four, student-led fundraising to raise the money necessary for installation costs of the solar panels for the entire school. Step five, propose another St. Lucie County Schools Refederum that would increase property taxes for four years and ask the school board to save money for the solar panel installations. Step six, use the money raised by Democrati student, faculty, and St. Lucie citizens to pay for solar panel installations at Democrati Middle School. Step seven, save hundreds and thousands of dollars over the next several years. Step eight, work with the St. St. Lucie County School Board to repurpose the money and saved on electricity bills and main and maintenance for, for educational purposes. Step nine, help other schools in our district begin the same process after they start to see the benefits of switching to solar energy as in McCarty. Step 10, help other schools in Florida switch to solar energy as well, eventually leading to most schools in the Sunshine State operating on sunshine energy, working together to produce a more sustainable and bright be and beautiful future for all. Hi, I'm Liliani Fantini and we are at Manatee Academy. I'm Alyssa Ruiz, Kristen Kamika, Jehan Shrita. 
our problem is is that citizens shouldn't have to pay for the high price for prescription medication because they are basic necessities. About 40 million people live in poverty. These people can barely afford their houses, let alone pay for their prescription medication. We think government should take action in this problem because they are the only ones that can rectify or raise awareness about it. Our other options were lowering the prices of um, prescription drugs for the lower class and the middle class. Our third alternative that we chose was to lower taxes for the lowest class and raise taxes for the highest class because the highest class they make the most in salary wise and if we raise their taxes it's giving back to the lower class that just can't afford anything. Hi, I'm Claire Jules from CAST. I'm Gabrielle Gessner. I'm Emma Rodriguez. I'm Lila Kaiser. The problem of our project is that St. Lucie County experiences high rates of dog-related attacks due to people not properly containing their dogs in public. There are several ways we can solve this problem, one of them being placing an infraction on someone's permanent record. This will ensure that people are less likely to let their dog in public anymore. We can also ensure that there's a fine from anywhere from $50 to $250, and then impound their dog and make them pay to get their dog back. The most effective solution is adding an infraction to someone's permanent record because of violation of administration regulation. Our plan of action would be to call the city clerk's office, try to get um, a meeting with the city council and tell them why this solution is effective and how we want it done and why. This, it wouldn't be a problem of like what's right and wrong, it's just what we want to do to stop this happening in our community for future generations. After that, if they would like to get it passed even furthermore, they would send it to a subcommittee and they would try to debate and discuss why this would be good and that would probably take a long time or not but we would try to go to every subcommittee meeting and try to get people involved and after that hopefully they would pass it to the city council and they would pass our solution. Victoria Venu from Northport K-8. Um, I'm Brooke Hunley from Northport K-8. I'm Eliya Dungan from Northport K-8. Aiden Vieira from Northport K-8. Our problem is about um, school shootings. Our There are guns allowed in school, which is our problem. So we tried to change the law or change the policy a little bit so that if you are found on campus with a gun, then you would be in serious trouble. And so we, we went along with the school shooting problem because we felt that it was um, getting out of hand for our community. Whenever Parkland occurred, we didn't have many, like, before Parkland occurred, we didn't have many, like, protocols that were protecting us other than, like, hiding and stuff. And there were no other ways for us to be safe in case someone did get on our campus. So we sat and we were re researched um, other ways and other things we could involve into our school that we could put in, par in effect after Parkland happened so we all feel secure and safe. We made up an um, idea that if when there's a new student or something like that, we um, how you get a whole bunch of papers, there can be a check um, off list if you have a gun at home. So if they're feeling like sad or like depressed and they want to like like you know shoot up to school, that they can like move the like hide the gun somewhere where they can't find it. Safety is a big priority when it comes to this kind of thing, and I think these policies would definitely assist in prevention of all of these things. The policies aren't necessarily taking away from them or taking away from their basic rights, so I think it's, you know, fair enough to prevent all these deaths and injuries just off of a few policies. Ariel Okamic, K-8. through Alex Okamic K-8. Michael McMurrin Okamic K-8. Aiden Hurtado Okamic K-8. Okay, so our problem come together for the better. Um, our class has identified the problem of diverse students in St. Lucie Public Schools um, in Florida who get bullied or do not feel accepted because 
the important people, places, and everyday issues um, about their culture or life are not taught about. St. Lucie County has recently implemented social emotional learning, um, which teaches critical social um, competences um, necessary for academic and life success. And their Attendance Matters campaign, which is a campaign to raise awareness um, for attendance, um, which is essential to academic success by implementing the social competences necessary for academic um, and life success in their, oh, sorry. Um, by implementing the campaign, Come Together for the Better, it will help the, the two other campaigns. Um, our class, oh, um, by t we can do this by gathering some information on the problem to make sure we fully understand what we're talking about um, and have good data to prove our point. We can add curricular activities um, that teach about people who don't um, get taught about and create after school activities that promote, that promote um, the general welfare of minor, minority students. To do all of this, um, our class is planning to create a campaign entitled Come Together for the Better. So the disadvantages and advantages are uh, number one, bullying will reduce. Number two, more cultural awareness. Number three, tolerance and acceptance. Knowledge of language and culture help minorities adapt to a diverse environment, inform about varied cultures, a rise in level of maturity, skills for a brighter future, and learning a new language and culture. The disadvantages are loss of cultural identity, social groups and social annihilation, teaching standards and teacher uh, bias, separation and teacher teaching quality. Our policy in order to solve our problem of diversity and inclusion in Port St. Lucie schools is to implement a campaign which Ariel recently stated but in order for us to fix it we need to come up with different policies or our alternative policies in order to solve this. So our first policy is to implement a curricular activity in schools across Port St. Lucie that improves how people see each other in everyday life. Since we take time to celebrate people from Hispanic Heritage Month, African American Month, it makes no sense to why we shouldn't celebrate people from all cultures. When we do this, we should include a program in schools that allows students to learn about their peers and others who are diverse. And by doing this, we can finally learn to accept each other and know that each other, know each other in ways we haven't. Another policy that we're going to use to implement into schools is an after-school program. This after-school program will function like the GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance. Like the GSA, it will see results that are the same if it functions the same. Because according to acula.org, GSAs make for safer schools by providing support and educating others about the people in the LGBTQ and by particip participating in activities that the people in the LGBTQ do. So by doing this and creating an after school program, things will improve for the better. However, obviously there are two, for these two alternative policies, there's going to be disadvantages. If we include a curricular activity, um, right here it says the people, some people might frown upon the different topics that we talk about because if we're going to be diverse, we have to include everyone. Not everyone agrees with everything, such as the LGBTQ. There's mixed reactions on the LGBTQ, and we can solve this by teaching about the LGBTQ, and if we do that, we can set differences aside. For, for our second policy, by including an after-school program, there's going to be people who disagree with it. And the people who disagree with it are going to take it to themselves and just be straight out rude to the people who are part of the group. But coming together as a group will fare for the better, since the people in the group will create a bond that is unbreakable and create, create, create a group that will not be break, broken by 
creating an after school program that's diverse. Okay, for our so for our action plan, we will be implementing a campaign as my peers have talked about that will include and help the people of the minority in everyday life. The, the steps to this, so we're, step one, we're going to need to identify the problem, which is pe people of the minority that are diverse are being bullied and excluded because of how they are, and they're, being, they're, they're getting depressed and not feeling good about themselves, and that needs to change. So step two, we, we need to gather our information. We, we, you need to look at things that are already listed. So it, in all of document, like a lot of documents, like the the Florida Constitution, even the inclusion of diverse groups is not listed. So we need to gather the information, look at all the options, so that we can develop a course of action. And finally, what we need to do, we need to implement this. We need to go to the school board, the superintendent. We need to present our issue. We need to present a, a solution, which is we need to teach people about diverse groups and minorities so that they can learn and be less prejudiced about people that are different from themselves. The Florida, the Florida Constitution states that all natural persons, female and male alike, equal before the law, have unalienable rights, among which the right to enjoy and defend life and liberty, and to pursue happiness, to be rewarded for industry, to acquire, possess, and protect property. But prejudice of today has taken a lot of that away from people of minority. My name is Jordan Swally, and I'm from Northport, K-8. My name is Audra Sissio. Hi, my name is Zoya Carmali. Hi, my name is Jeremiah Battle. Our project is about opioids, and the problem about it is how it's very addicting and how it could cause many negative effects on family and friends. And it brings us down as a community, and it won't let us progress more into the future with our youth being affected by it. And we just want the best for the future of our generation. Our action plan consists of three phases. Our first phase is um, education. We will start by educating students grade 6 through 8 for, with the Too Good for Drugs program. Our second phase is awareness. We could make posters and place them around our community explaining the negative effects of opioids. And our third phase is um, a letter writing campaign and we could write letters to our mayor for to help with funding for family families that are struggling with opioid addictions. We had interviewed a lady named Marianne Warren and she works at New Horizons um, and she has a student assistant program that is welcome for, to all to learn more about opioids and what the problem is and just get educated a little bit more about it. Our action plan doesn't violate anybody's rights and it doesn't violate the Constitution. My name is Zoe Schlafmitz. My name is Amanda Rodweller. And my name is Alexa Cardis. We're from St. Lucie West K-8. The problem we will be discussing today is bus stop safety. The problem is that many students ride school buses every day. These students deserve to have a safe experience while they are getting onto and off of the buses. This is not always the case. In many instances, drivers are going through bus stops and passing buses illegally even when children are getting onto and off of the buses. Students have been injured and even killed walking to the buses, getting on their buses, and getting off their buses, even in St. Lucie County. In 2014, a Port St. Lucie High School student was killed walking to her bus when she was hit by a woman driving a car. All students deserve to be safe when walking to buses, getting on buses, and getting off of buses. No student should have to fear being injured or killed because of a careless or distracted motorist or someone who is under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Additionally, all drivers should be aware of the laws requiring people to stop for 
bus, school buses. Alternatives. For our alternatives, we have decided to compile a description of things that could be done to help with the problem of school bus arm violations. Number one, from our research, we found that many people are just not educated about the law when it comes to stopping when school buses have extended the stop sign. Many people do not know the laws about when they should stop based on what type of road they are on. Number two, driver education courses already include information about what to do at school bus stops. Unfortunately, not everyone takes driver education in Florida when they learn to drive. Number three, many people know the law, but they have decided that they will not comply with the law and refuse to stop correctly for bus stops that have the stop arm extended. Number four, many people are driving under the influence of drugs and or alcohol and are impaired when they come to school bus stops. Number five, many people are texting or distracted in some way when they come to school bus stops and run past the stop arm when students are getting onto or off of the buses. Our policy. We decided to work on the idea of educating people on, on edu of educating more people about the importance of stopping at school bus stops. We feel if people were really educated and updated about when you need to stop at school bus stops, more people might obey the law. We want to tell everyone about current Florida laws relating to when to stop at bus stops and at what type of roadways. We want to have everyone know more about what kids might do at school bus stops. And third, we want all drivers to know about the penalties for violating school bus stop signs. Our action plan. From our research, we determined that the number one problem about violation of school bus um, of school bus stop rules is that people simply don't know about the Florida laws. We created a website to educate drivers in St. Lucie County about the current Florida laws that deal with school bus stop signs. We want to make people aware of our website and how they can use it to learn about Florida school bus stop laws so that school bus stops can be made safer for our students. A lot of these bus stops are also on the main roads, which is another problem that should be dealt with. People that could be contacted about our problems and solutions are as followed. The St. Lucie County School superintendent, the St. Lucie County School Board, the governor of Florida, and more specifically, the uh, transportation section of the St. Lucie County School Board. Hi, I'm Julia Wilmoth, and I go to Palm Point. Hi, I'm Ava Borgella. Hi, I'm Rihanna Garcia. Hi, I'm Marco Scotto, and I go to Palm Point. Um, so our project is about um, that we don't have out-of-county field trips and that's a problem because other schools do have out-of-county field trips and our survey results showed that we should have out-of-county field trips so that we can have hands-on experiences. So we have two different alternative solutions for this problem and one was virtual reality and the second one was in-school field trips but both of them have the same problem and it's in the name virtual reality meaning it's not real. So to see if we were correct about what we thought. We surveyed all of our school and found out that 77% of students decided that out-of-county field trips would be better because they got to experience more hands-on things. Uh, my group was our policy, which uh, we had three reasonings for uh, the policy that we came up with. Uh, one of them was that the students retain more information by using their hands and as our um, our survey results showed more agreed with having more field trips. And my group was the action plan. We had two things that we've done. We made a survey which the results was 90% of students wanted field trips and to get the hands-on experience. And another one that we could have done was present to the principal so that maybe she could bring field trips back to her school. Hi, I am Mason Smith for St. Lucie West K-8 School. I'm Natalie Broyles. I'm Haley Rosal. And I'm Wyatt Roberts. Our project is about school violence safety. My job was the problem, and some of the problems are that many people over the years have been injured and killed by all these different school shootings that have been going on. And it's a very serious problem throughout the entire world. My job was to do the alternative per policies. We decided that our two alternative policies were going to be bulletproof glass and arming teachers in schools. Bulletproof glass has its pros and cons. Some pros would be that it's stronger to bullets, so bullets would be able to penetrate it as easily. But the cons would be it's expensive, 
to put in schools and expensive to cut. With arming teachers comes with many pros and cons too. Arming teachers would be very good if you have a school shooter in the school, you get an, more of an immediate reaction so not as deaths would happen. But many cons to that would be students would be more stressed and you would have you could have issues with the gun accidentally being triggered or an incident with that with teachers and students. I did the our policy. The policy our class believes to be the most effective is night lock door barricades. Advantages, advantages of this policy are the price and the accessibility while using the barricades. During our interview with Mark Woods, he told us the shooter is, is trying to shoot as many people as possible in the time before the police arrive. If all the classrooms have these barricades, then the shooter won't be able to get in or shoot anyone. With the price, it is $150,000 to $300,000 for every class in every school in our county. Disadvantages of this policy are it may distract people or offend people and it's easy to play with. Our policy is constitutional because it doesn't violate any rights. Even though it may block people from getting out the door, it does not block them from getting out the windows. My job was to do the action plan. Now, what we, what we were trying to do is uh, we were trying to get the principal on board with our idea, then try and get the principal to spread it to other people in the other, other schools around St. Lucie County in general as a whole, and then eventually get it to the school board, get it to the school board, board pitch the idea, and hopefully they implement it. Uh, the way we can actually be able to fund this is through maybe donations, donations from other people. The, the people who might oppose our policy are taxpayers who don't have school-aged children because they don't understand the benefit for them as a person in this world, and firefighters because they wouldn't be able, like us being able to barricade ourselves, bar, bar, barricade ourselves. People who might uh, actually be on board with our policy are some school board officials once we present ideas, f facts about school shootings around the world, how could they affect people's lives in general, and some kids in the school in general so they can feel much safer when they go to school and not feel like every day something could happen to them, even worse than that in general. I'm Shay McKay. I'm John Doherty. Lacey Ford. Brooke Roden, North Support BBK. Um, basically, our project is about um, teenagers drinking, doing drugs, alcohol, smoking. It's affecting them with negative, lots of negative um, health issues. It's just very bad for them. And what we're going to be doing here is trying to have stricter regulations and help prevent them causing any more damage to themselves. The policies we've thought of to stop this and hinder the these harmful products progression towards teens is to place flyers in public pl in public places such as parks or schools and raise awareness so people don't take it in the first place. And we can also, we thought of that we could have therapy sessions to, to stop people from even thinking of trying these. And, and or have a, a free period at the end of the school day. But the disadvantages of this would be that it would add to the school day and it would cost more money. But to stop this, we could make it optional so that you would have a choice whether to do it or not. Um, we decided to change, like, we decided that we need a stricter regulation, we need stricter regulations or a stronger policy against this because the policy that is in place already is not enforced well enough or strong enough to prevent the problem from continuing. Thank you all very much. And we've decided to put up flyers and put the consequences of vaping of underage teens and as well as informing parents to tell their kids about vaping and 
what it can do to you on the inside since most commercials, they can produce it but never tell you the consequence of it. Janelle Tingling. Sophia Barnaby. Bianca Trendle. Okay, so the topic we have today is police brutality. We, we picked the topic police brutality because it is affecting our community and how some law enforcement officers are abusing their power and how they're resorting to their weapons as a first resort. For example, for instance, in Fort, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, the UPS hijacking ended in bullets, of, ended in a hail of bullets and two deaths, the UPS driver Frank Ordonez and, a, and an innocent bystander, Richard Cutshaw. Our first alternative to solving this issue was enforcing harsher punishments for unnecessary violence. Punishing used use correctly has been proven to show that it can reduce problem ba bad behavior over time. We didn't go with this alternative though because we weren't sure how effective it would be to our cause. Our second alternative was um, banning all military weapons in local and state police because we do not believe that such small agencies need such high dangerous weapons. But we didn't go with this either because if they were in a potentially hazardous situation, they would need some weapons to defend themselves. Our third alternative, our proposal, was to reform the 1033 program and to enforce more de-escalation training. And so the 1033 program is a program that legally allows the Department of Defense to distribute militarized weapons to uh, local and state law enforcement agencies. And right now there are over 8,000 law enforcement agencies participating in the 1033 program. And by reforming the 1033 program, we mean that we will start convincing and persuading law enforcement agencies to statewide to start rejecting the majority of the weapons that are given to them that are unnecessary in their area because some agencies are receiving tanks and that seems like really extreme and excessive and so weapons that would stay would be like the weapons for SWAT teams and uh, other guns that are not as excessive as tanks and so our action plan steps what we would do to achieve this is that we would first talk to the FPSI, the Florida Public Safety Institute, uh, because they are the ones who fund uh, the training programs. And so we would talk to them about helping us bump up the number of hours for de-escalation training or crisis intervention training. We would also next talk to the FDLE, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and their director, Jeffrey Mark Glass, and also convince them about training about enforcing the training programs and helping start um, rejecting the weapons that are given to them from the from the Department of Defense and then we would also talk to our sheriff Ken Mascara because he is one of the because he's the one responsible for accepting the weapons that are given to the county for uh, from the Department of Defense and because as for instance there was a shooting a garage shooting in Fort Pierce where a man was uh, an officer was called over because of a noise complaint and a man was shot in his garage because uh, because the officer was under pressure or circumstances and while we're saying is that Ken Mascara is uh, a little bit partly involved in this situation is because Ken Mascara stood out and released a statement that the officer did the best possible decision that he could under the circumstances. But with our proposed policy that we are proposing, the officer could have went through more training and he could have made a better decision and maybe the victim who was killed will still be here with his family right now. Hi, I'm Malia. I'm from Northport K-8. I'm Julian from Northport K-8. I'm Tyresha from Northport K-8. I'm Lita from Northport K-8. Our overall project is about how people are, in Port St. Lucie specifically, are taking their trash and plastic and they're just throwing it out. So it ends up in our bodies of water and it ends up the fish eat it because they think it's food. So then we consume the fish and we become sick. So. Um, it's killing our fish, our marine life, and it's overall just making our community look bad. So that is what our problem is. All, our alternative policies are that um, uh, is defined, it's 15 or less pounds for $100, 
of littering. Uh, we don't think that's a lot, so we would like to raise that fine. But the problem with that is people would just not care about it. But also we would like to have better security cameras in public places. It should not affect uh, people's constitutional rights, but it will uh, cost a lot of money. And we would also, also like to have people do community service hours for their colleges uh, applications. And those are our three main alternative policies. Our action plan is to um, reduce plastic all over Port St. Lucie, and we can do that by starting at our school, Northport K-8, by um, doing um, PowerPoints and putting posters up all around the school and to um, drive awareness at our school. And um, one way that our school is doing that is by collecting um, plastic bottle caps to make a buddy bench, and so people can talk and sit to if you have problems. And we're and you need about I think you need about 200 plastics or pounds of plastic, and we can and we also took surveys at our school, which are on our board, and we can also or by taking those surveys there are where people try to use them more and people who also do these and we have our statistics on our board which the orange is to is what they do and the blue part is to where they will try to do more and there are people who do support us in this one organization would be keep port st lucy beautiful they worked with us and we had multiple interviews with them and they actually gave us some of the things on our board like the pamphlet to spread awareness the surveys to see how other people are doing and wait and to suggest other ways to reduce it and some of the posters we have as well Project Citizen really is a culmination of the learning that students have been doing in their first semester work in their civics course. It is a combination of putting together public policy and the levels of government that are involved, the Constitution, and really showing how they can be a part of their community and do good within their community even at such a young age. And when they go and become voting age, they have an even greater impact on their community.